You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Greg Isle. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories, bringing you the very best author interviews from the best writers writing today. I'd like to thank some sponsors today that make the show possible. Patricia Gillum, A Superhero's Duty, a fight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. A Superhero's Duty by Patricia Gillum. There's a link to it in the show notes. I'd also like to tell you about my friend Crystal Pico Watanabe of Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. Visit Crystal and her team of eight people who help her provide services to fiction authors. Crystal's full slate of services now include beta reading, manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors, you can also inquire about putting your books in her Book Lover's Box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. This is free for authors for a limited time. PicosHouse.com for all your book publishing needs. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am really excited to have Greg Isles on the show with me today. Uh, Greg has been a, uh, a literary hero of mine for quite some time, uh, a fellow Mississippian and uh, the writer of fantastic books. Uh, happy to have you here today, Greg. Welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Hank. Looking forward to it. Greg, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Wow. You, you start with the big one, don't you? Uh, <laughs> That's right. We go straight for the juggler. You know, here's the thing. I don't really have a memory like that. Writing was just something that, as I went through my very young life, on through school, that people just told me I could do or that I was had a gift for, okay? I was just into reading, okay? I, I didn't imagine even that there were guys sitting in a room somewhere writing these things like the Count of Monte Cristo that just took me to some other place, you know? Um, and so the idea that I could become one of those guys, yeah, that didn't really hit until much later. And even then, when you grew up in Mississippi, man, the last person who, you know, had really made a life of that that I knew about was William Faulkner. Right. <laughs> and how do you how do you draw a line that you know from where you are to say yeah I'm going to be William Faulkner? You just you you can't. You know you're raised to be a doctor, a lawyer, a engineer, or whatever. You know, or they they hope you are. So, um, but there just there just came a time. You know, my first my first job after college and during college was a musician. You know, right. I was an artist. That's an equally crazy profession to pick, <laughs> but at least you can make a living, you know, in your in and around your state and region by playing music. And that doesn't exist for writers. You know, there's no sort of farm league for writers. As you know, <laughs> you're either unpublished or you're published. Now there are a lot of published writers who are not really making a living and, and, and have to keep their regular job. So I guess you could consider that, sort of the farm league you know when i was starting out i met women who you know wrote one romance novel every two months and paid their house note and insurance and stuff you know but i get, i'm giving you a long answer there sorry about that no but, no uh, that's 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 the answer so yeah so anyway you know when i got to college i i realized you know you know this is something i would like to do but i pursued music instead and then when i was about 29 man um I made $30,000 that year, I think, or somewhere around that, and I was on tour for 50 weeks a year, and I realized, man, this is no way to 
this is no way to live, you know, this is, this is not going to work. And I had just gotten married and, uh, and so I just stopped and I gave myself one year to write a best selling novel, as crazy as that sounds. And I managed to do it, which is just seems crazy looking back. But I've, I've heard a, a similar story to that, um, uh, from a, from a couple of different people. Um, and there's, there's something about that, that personal challenge. Uh, I'm going to give myself a year to do this. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to dip into my savings and would do whatever. And then once that year is over, I, I'm going to just, you know, close, close the, the chapter. I'm going to go on to do something else. And, uh, it, you know, I've, I've heard that story turn out well more times than not. Um, do you think that there's something psychological about just that, that do or die? This is my last shot. I'm going to do it. Uh, or I'm not. Uh, do, I do think, think there's it's... something magical about it if it is your last shot. Mm. Hank, okay. If, if you just, like, I know a guy, I know a guy who, one of the smartest guys I know, I don't want to give too many details, and he's he's successful now, uh, but not as a writer. And, and he had grown up wanting to be a writer from the start. And he had the brains to do it, certainly. And after college, he I won't say where, but he went to a, this idyllic house on a beach and sat there every day. And he gave himself a certain amount of time. You know, it may have been a year, it may have been six months. And at the end of it, he realized that there was nothing there. He didn't have it, you know. So that that was not a happy ending. And he probably didn't give himself a fair shot. I mean, who among us at 23 is, is ready to do that? Right. But, but I think you're right to say that when if you have a gift – and you are in that situation, and you just say, by God, I'm locking the door, and I'm giving it 100% till I beat this thing into submission. <laughs> there's, a lot, there's a lot to be said for doing that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I'm really fascinated by and I'd love to talk about is the, the intersection between different artistic expressions and, and how they tend to inform one another, or they tend to – uh, I, I don't know if it's some, some wiring that happens in our brain that, uh, that allow, that if we, if we pursue one, it, it tends to inform the other, or make the other stronger. Um, do you ever feel like your time as a musician has, uh, informed your writing, has made you a better writer, or has equipped you in some way, uh, to be a better storyteller? 100%. And the primary reason is, um, rhythm. You know, Mm -hmm. language has a rhythm. And I've had this sort of quarrel with editors. Uh, If you get an an editor that's sort of tone deaf or something, uh, they'll make a suggestion or something, and and you you think, how could they possibly suggest this? Don't they see the rhythm of what's there, you know, and that the change is going to interfere with that? And the quickest way to find that out and I wish I had the luxury to do this with more of my book than I do, and that is to read it aloud. Um, I've got a guy, the editor who discovered me on my very first book, Span Out Phoenix, and he gave me my first deal. Uh, he and I just talk on the phone now. And uh, now and then when we come to really important parts or I'm an important part of the book, or you know, I don't get the chance that much. I write under such time pressure, but now and then I get to put in a piece of what I call lapidary prose, you know, where it's <laughs> really just trying to get it right. And we'll, we'll just find ourselves reading aloud back and forth on the phone. And the second you start to read aloud, choices about words, subtle meanings, whatever, instantly become apparent when you do that. And I think that began with music and songwriting and, and just unconsciously studying songs, the concise nature of songwriting. People like Paul Simon, you know, uh, who just have done, or even John Prine, you know, people who, oh. com, people who've communicated very complex and moving things in three verses, you exactly. know, you got, you, you got to just, you, you, you're blown away by it and you can't. You realize, man, I'll never measure up to this, you know, but you try. If you can rip somebody's heart out in three and a half minutes, uh, then then you've got it. Man, you take a song like Angel from Montgomery, John <laughs> Prine. <laughs> yeah. Man, what novel ever ripped your heart out like that song? Exactly. Or, or you know what, like one of my favorite things Stephen King ever did it was the story The Body, which became the movie Stand By Me. Mm. Okay? Yeah. 
great, great movie. And that nostalgia contained in there is so poignant. And you take the John Prine song, Paradise, about growing up in the coal mining country down on the river. You know, Daddy oh, wants yeah. to take me back to Muhlenberg County. You know, where the air smelled like snakes and we'd shoot with our pistols, but empty pop bottles was all we would kill. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, there it is, yeah. man. Yeah, and, and there's a whole generation of songwriters coming up now that John Prine informed and are carrying on that tradition. I, I think of Jason Isbell, uh, especially that can just, I mean, he slays me. And then, and, and you can, you can go back and you can see that Prine influence and there's, uh, it, it, it's just amazing stuff that he does. Well, let me tell you, I hadn't really discovered Isbel yet. Everybody's telling me about him. I'm friends Dude. with Mac McAnally. Oh, yeah. I was, I was just over in Muscle Shoals and I think Jason recorded something over there. So I'm going to start listening from to the songs. Yeah. He's, he's from, from there originally. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Get, gotcha. get his, get his album Southeastern and I dare you. Uh, to have a dry eye at the end. I dare you. Okay. All, All right. right. I'll check okay. it out. All right. Let's, so now that we've established that, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you're, um, you talked about, uh, the rhythm and kind of the cadence, uh, of writing. And, you know, a, a writer's voice is one of those things that, that we talk about and, and you can't, you can't exactly put your, your finger on what, what defines a writer's voice. Um, on a on a micro level, when when you're talking about the rhythm of prose, um, do you ever stand back and look at the page, just the the physical view of the page, and tell if, especially if it's dialogue, can you tell if if the the passage is doing what you want it to do? Is there a visual aspect um, talking about rhythm that that comes across in writing? You know, that's an interesting question, and I would say that I don't normally do that, and I think the reason I don't is because working in the realm of the word processor, pagination is so fluid, you right. know? And, and of course, yeah, you can look at a dialogue scene much in the way you look at a screenplay, and you get a certain level of feel about it. Now, this is getting into subtle, crafty things, but, oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I imagine your eye – and your brain is making a judgment just to sort of the relationship between space and text, you know, right. how much space, how much text, how much, uh, conciseness do you have? Um, you think about some of those great old Hollywood screenwriters, man, where it was just, pow, 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 you know, all yeah. through there. And there are times when I try to get that, um, you wouldn't think so in long books, but I, I will say, even though I write long, I think the only way that I've managed to succeed is by giving people the sense while they're reading it that it's not long, that, that they're moving through it very fast. Yes. Yeah. Otherwise, there'd be no way to get them to read an 800-page book, you know? Right, right. And, I mean, and there's – yeah, no, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Larry, Larry McMurtry, man, <laughs> the gold standard of a long <laughs> book, man, uh, Lonesome Dove. Come on. It's like yeah. you, you pray that book would never end, you know? Yeah. And, and there's things about dialogue, you know, you, sometimes you get that, that, uh, rapid fire back and forth. And then sometimes you get, uh, the, the uh, like BB King talks about the spaces between the notes and the, uh, oh, the, yeah. so, sometimes the most powerful thing is what's not said or what's alluded to and, and letting the reader kind of, uh, breathe with it for a little bit. That's right. That's right. Yeah. God, I'm listening to you say that. And I thought about McMurtry and I think about. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Duvall playing Gus and just lines. I mean, you talk about John Prine level lines oh, yeah. like, "By God, Woodrow, it ain't dying. I'm talking about it's living." <laughs> you know, just or like Stephen King, get oh, busy yeah. living or get busy dying. That's there right. There it is, man. There it is. That's that's powerful stuff. Um, would you, uh, you gave yourself that time to, to figure it out, to be a writer and uh, put yourself under, uh, self-imposed deadline and Spandau Phoenix came out of that, right? Yes, it did. did yeah. That, uh, Spandau Phoenix, uh, uh, I, I love that book. It's absolutely, uh, amazing. It is very different from, uh, probably what a, what a lot of people discovered you for now, and uh, you know the the Natchez Burning trilogy. Um, what was the initial uh, idea for Spandau, and and uh, have you always been uh, a thriller guy and uh, that uh, kind of big stage? Uh, well, I'm gonna story? tell you the real truth. The real okay. truth, Hank, is that I told you. You know, I was at a point in my career I didn't really have any money. You know, I was going to yep. try to transition and become a writer, and 
in music, I had made a cardinal mistake, and that is that I had got caught up in playing other people's music to make the highest money that I could playing music to survive, rather than just going, you know what, I'm going to drop everything, move to Los Angeles, and do nothing but write songs, okay? So when I made the switch to writing books, I said, I, I'm, not, I'm not messing around here, okay? I'm going to write, I've got to write something that will sell in the heart of the publishing industry, and that's New York City, and I've got to stand out from everything else. And so I very consciously said I've got to write a best-selling novel. And around that time, we were still in the day of, you know, Jack Higgins and I guess Tom Clancy had come out and stuff like that. And so I just said, uh, and, you know, um, got Frederick Forsyth had written some great stuff, Ken Follett. You know, all those guys had done World War II books. And I was born in Germany. I knew a lot about it. My dad had served over there. And uh, so one night, believe it or not, I was watching 60 Minutes, and I saw a feature on Rudolf Hess being the last surviving Nazi prisoner of Spandau Phoenix. And there was this unsolved mystery about it. And it just hit me like an arrow right in the brain. I just said, man, that's it right there. It just that's a, that's a thriller waiting to happen. And I mean, look, you, people ask me often, you know, what was the last thing you wrote before Spandau Phoenix? And I say, my college term paper, you know, <laughs> uh, literally over 10 years before my college term paper. That was the last thing I wrote. And then I sat down and wrote a novel 241,000 words long, you know. Wow. Uh, and, man, you talk about an education, uh, sort of a self-education. And, I, you know, I'm not – so many people I meet now, it shocks me. They say that's their favorite book. And I'm embarrassed about that book because I feel like, oh, you just, I did, I was so poor at that point at developing character and all that. And think about the fundamental dictum of write what you know. You know, I knew a lot about World War II, but my God, I was writing about German characters and, you know, I was really stretching. Yeah. Now, I think with the second book, Black Cross, ironically, I think that's the best book I've ever written from the point of view of craft, from the point of view of story, intensity, all of it. And it's the only book I've ever written that wasn't a bestseller. I think it had to do with the paperback jacket. But anyway, the industry abounds with ironies. And when people (laughs) ask me, I always say, you know, Black Cross is the best one, even though it's different from everything I've done since, you know. Yeah. Um, It's it's a really interesting um, – discussion uh, sometimes turns into argument between writers and uh, about writing to market and writing you know serious uh, literature that comes from the heart and it, it can't be uh, written to market because uh, you know these are these are serious books um, when but there, there's something about uh, you know when you're focusing on on this area and and, and know that you're going to write a book that's going to appeal to this uh, certain market uh, but still there was this moment where the story came alive to you um do do you what do you say to people who who say you can't write to market or you can't write uh books that are that are meant to sell uh and and not still be uh a story that grabs people by the heart and uh you know does its work man look you you're right in the sort of dilemma that i've lived in my whole career which is (laughs) if you're if you're not going to write to market to some extent, you better find another job because you're going right. to be doing another job most of your time. Okay. Yeah. Well, you need somebody uh, to buy the stuff that you do. Yes, you do. So I've made concessions to genre all the way through. There's no question about it, you know, and I've tried, I'd be a lot richer today if I had just 100% made the concession. And the minute I had a best-selling novel on the times just do what you know a lot of bestsellers do and just start rewriting that book every time out you know i I can at least say i've never done that i've always followed what really interested me and i think i've dealt with some pretty serious issues in my books and and so in that sense i wasn't sitting down trying to write the great american novel or anything and i absolutely was writing for the heart from the heart but if you think i wasn't evaluating it based on the market at least at least not like what is the best thing for the market i don't ask myself that question but i do ask myself will this thing that has hold of my brain and my heart right now will the market accept this on any level can i squeeze it into what people will accept i mean if you look at my natchez burning trilogy 
which started as one book, wound up as three, took 10 years, was over 2,000 pages long, and dealt with race murder. I mean, how many strikes could I put against myself? <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. Even my, my first publisher, I lost my first publisher over that when I went to to three books. I mean, they couldn't, they couldn't go with me on that journey, man. It was the scariest point in my life, you know, after my accident. And I just, I just pushed on and said, well, the hell with it. I'm going to do it the way I want. And probably nobody's ever going to buy this. And it's just a miracle that it worked. And, uh, I, I want to get back to that story in just a minute of, of Natchez burning and how that, that, uh, uh, could blew up to what it is now. Um, but for just a minute, y- you also have written books, uh, in, uh, you, you, you've done your World War II thrillers, uh, you've done, uh, some legal thrillers, and you've done some science fiction, uh, we were talking about, uh, before we started. <laughs> um, what, uh, what do you think about writers who, uh, who are kind of all over the place with, with their, the things that they love and, uh, and does a writer have to stay in the, the genre that people expect them to? Well, not 95% of writers do have to, and all the pressure from the industry and publishers pushes, pushes you to that. And also the public, I think a lot of writers would like to break out of the box they're in. They don't have that luxury. And the only way you get to do it is by, somehow finding a way to do one and then if you manage to pull it off and keep selling books at the level of your other ones because if you if you slip or slide or don't perform they'll, they'll, they'll never let you do it again you know right so i think all all writers are eclectic in their taste but they get confined in this little box and for me uh you know probably the most powerful moment of my life under 10 was when I saw my dad took me to see 2001 A Space Odyssey in 1968, you know. I heard George Clooney tell the same story, you know, and he and I are exactly (laughs) the same age. And that thing was so powerful, it just, like, ripped my brain open, and it opened my mind to science fiction in a way that just, uh, you know, and I'm I'm not an aficionado now. I'm not up on current science fiction or anything like that. But, you know, when I was 14... 13, 14, I read all that, Isaac Asimov and the classics and stuff. And I've always had the desire in me to, uh, I have two outlined science fiction novels, and one I think is the greatest concept I've ever come up with. But I know it can be a minefield. This gets right at what you're asking about what you are permitted to do, what you can do. I think George Clooney made the remake of Solaris or Solaris, you know, the, I think was originally a Russian film. Right. Um, I may, I may be wrong about the origin, but, but, uh, I think Clooney did that because it was sort of his attempt to get close to a 2001 kind of story. And, you know, I don't, it, certainly it wouldn't compare to his huge commercial films in terms of success, you know, now George Clooney can afford to make a passion project then and now and then and, <laughs> You know, can I afford to do that? I don't know. You know, and when I say can I afford, I don't mean it's a financial decision. It's a decision that has to do with, you know, you and your publisher and your public. You know, will they? It's like, you know, um, who? You know, some metal band decides to make an acoustic album. You know, does their Dylan goes electric? You know, does the fan does the fan base (laughs) accept it? I don't know. You know. Wow. Uh, well, it's probably why a lot of writers write under, uh, pseudonyms or pen names when they branch out, just to give a little distance to that from their brand, so to speak. Right. But think how, think what a waste that is. You're going to throw away all the work you've done, everything you've built to be John Smith. I mean, geez, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> it yeah. is hard. It is hard. Well, maybe, maybe one day that will work itself out, but, uh, that's uh i I'm, i look forward to seeing what you come up with the uh, science fiction uh, one day thanks uh so greg your your trilogy natchez burning um this you mentioned that it was uh, originally one book and uh, and you wanted to extend it and you know there's uh all this stuff happened to you personally you you had a uh, a personal tragedy a car wreck that was happening about this time and then um also, all the stuff happened with the fallout from this book. Um, can you tell us what happened and, and what uh, made you want to extend the story? Yeah. Okay. It initially started to be one book, and I, I was a foolish 
young man, I feel like now, looking back, thinking that. Um, it, you know, here was a story that was going to deal with my hometown, with real-life civil rights murders, with race, with family, so many things. And as I started, I made, I was just coming off a number one book in paperback. And I worked for a year, then over a year, I was late on my deadline. And I started to realize there was no way one book could contain the story. And that was disturbing to my publisher who had paid me a lot of money and was waiting <laughs> to get their, you know, get their their book, you know, and uh, I just dragged on and on. And I and look, I'm guilty of that. And um, I pulled out on Highway 61 one day and uh car hit my truck, you know, truck hit my car door going 70 miles an hour. And I woke up out of a coma a week later, missing my leg with a torn aorta and many, many broken bones. And so my... My attitude just changed after that. I mean, I just, when you come that close to dying, you just, you stop caring about even the exigencies of business. You know, you just, you just say, what is, what is it I'm trying to do? And right. I realized that dealing with those themes and everything, I just had to let the chips fall. And so I did. And, and people, when I start to tell that story, people assume, I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but they assume it's like an Oprah story. You know, they could say, <laughs> oh, you know, you followed your bliss and look how great it turned out. That is not what happened. It was it was like Jerry Maguire when he writes the note at his company. You know, the next thing I knew, I'd lost my publisher and I parted ways with my agent. I had no job and I owed all the money I'd been living on for the past two years back to my publisher. You know, and it was just the scariest part of my career. But it gave me the freedom uh, to just, he gave me the freedom to just say, you know what, the hell with it, man. I'm going to yeah. do what I need to do, and uh, and so I did, and 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 fate just kind of saved me, you know. A uh, older, an editor who had edited me before at another publishing house came along and and saved me by giving me a deal, and then the book just you know, debuted at number two. It was just unbelievable. I think there was just a pent-up demand after many years. You know, conventional wisdom is that after a long time off the shelf, you're forgotten and you're nobody. But I think by being off the shelf five years, uh, demand had built up, and that made people give it a chance, whereas otherwise they might have gone, what is this guy doing writing this huge book, you know? Uh, <laughs> right. So, so anyway, it- uh, I mean, that, that was a long answer, but you yeah. get the idea. Was it was it the same kind of feeling when you gave yourself that that initial year to get something done? Um, was it that- was, but it was more desperate than that because mm. you know you feel some desperation when you're 29, looking at 30, and all your friends are, you know, getting their first medical residency or or you know they're out in the world, they've had one or two kids, and they're making a living, and you're like, what am I doing? You know, right. I'm playing in some college bar in wherever, you know, but. So, yeah, that's a certain kind of desperation, but that's nothing like having gotten to some semblance of the top of your profession and then and then almost be snatched into the grave and just realize. I mean, I really had doctors just tell me, say, you know, 99 percent of the people with your injury die within the first hour. Wow. So once you've been there, you just it's like you just say, well, all right, you know, I'm just. That's not even intensity, man. It's just sort of like, it's like, it reminds me of, uh, it's not like miraculous survival and you feel revitalized. It's more like what I've heard military stories say, where guys say in Vietnam or wherever, or World War One, they just sort of already considered themselves dead. And once they consider that, they just stop being scared, you know? Right. Uh, you just say, well... Whatever happens is going to be whatever happens. Yeah. And that's the space you really need to be in when you're doing what you talked about. You know, we say write the book from the heart or these stereotypical things. What that really means is to write without fear. Exactly. And to do, and to do that is hard because yeah. we all, we're all afraid of failure. We're all afraid of not selling the book. We're all afraid of, you know, terrible reviews of the public not getting what it is you're trying to do. And when you wake up one day and you just say, man, I couldn't care less about yeah. any of that, any of it, then that's the most liberating thing to just say, by God, I'm going to take hold of these difficult subjects and I'm going to, like I said, referral, you know, or just wrestle them into submission, kill them or they're going to kill me. 
you know. Well, it's it's a great gift when you realize that your give a shit's busted. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's right. <laughs> Did you make that up or somebody I, else? I, I don't know. I'll, I'll take credit now, and I'll uh, I'll I'll put a note in the show notes if I figure out who said it better than me. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean it. Re- it really is. You're right. Yeah. Um, as a kid who who grew up in East Central Mississippi and uh, in the '70s and '80s, um, you know, we saw a lot of stuff, and we saw things that then get turned into movies and 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 books, and and you. Uh, but we we also see the world changing uh, from from our perspective, uh, and then you realize the world doesn't change as much as you think and uh it, it's it's a real weird thing growing up in in a place like like we do um and when you start peeling back the layers and telling those stories um a lot of people wish that some of those stories would would just go away um i i grew up just down the road from philadelphia mississippi where the, sure the uh, civil yeah. where the civil rights murders happened i knew some of the people um through through family connections that went to prison for that uh we were very our community was very closely connected to that um a yeah. lot of people wish that stuff would just go away uh i i've been working on a book for a couple of years now that that deals with uh with a similar situation like that, when, when you find yourself in the place where, where you just don't care anymore and you're going to tell the story that needs to be told, um, how do you start crafting this story that becomes Natchez burning? And, and this is a huge story. It's more than just the surface story that gets that, you know, dropped into bullet points. Um, how, how do you start working out a story that's going to be that big? Well, you know what? Thankfully I had, let me think for a second. The challenge is it is its own answer in a way. Okay, the challenge of dealing. Think about what happened in Philadelphia. Your real dilemma at the start is okay. These are real events that I'm taking off from. Why is it that I'm not writing a nonfiction book? What 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 justifies a novel here to deal with this? Okay. Now, in what happened in Neshoba County, we were left after the events of history with a pretty accurate picture of what actually transpired. Yeah. Okay. Probably things, some things remained unknown, but we knew what happened in the case of the, of the silver dollar group in Concordia parish, which overall was much worse than the people over your way. Okay. Yeah. The FBI said it was the worst in the country. All right. So much, so many had died. So much remained unknown victims' families even were dying. It was a situation where the truth could never really be known. The heroic reporter Stanley Nelson learned a lot and developed theories of the cases and I think came very close in a lot of cases. But it, the the real heart of it couldn't be known. And that created a natural space that almost demanded a fictional treatment. It was ideal for it and almost cried out for it. And it gets to the sort of Stephen King thing of, uh, fiction is the truth inside the lie. You know, right. by creating a fictional version of that, I could go deeper into it than history ever was going to be able to because so much was just lost. And so that that gave me the limits, sort of, of my story. It gave me the framework of it. And from there, then it was, uh, and I actually came up with that, you know, before I decided to use Penn Cage for it. You know, Penn was lingering from the other books, and I thought, you know, He's got. He's ideally suited for that. He's right here. He's got. He's an attorney. He was an attorney. He's a novelist. He, he, he's dealt with history. He, he's my guy. You know. I mean, the template for that for me was uh, all the King's Men and yeah. Robert Penn Warren dealing with Huey Long. I mean, I really think that. I, I look at that. I mean, that's an old white guy's opinion, but I look at that <laughs> as maybe the greatest American novel. You know, I mean, that thing, it's as relevant right this second as yeah. it was the day it was written. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I love about your novels is the way that you portray characters and the way that you fearlessly uh, portray characters, all kinds of characters. And you're not afraid to let characters be nuanced and, and gray. And sometimes uh, evil characters, um, in, in their mind, they have good motivations and they think they're doing the right thing. And, and sometimes, uh, people that may be martyred or, uh, you know, become larger than life after the fact, um, 
they're still great characters too. And, and even in the, uh, the noble stands, they take their, their regular humans. Um, I think I heard you say one time that the difference between good and evil is, is the, the line right through the, the middle of the human heart. Um, can you talk a little bit about character building and, and being honest with people and letting them be who they are? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, look, we all, we all writers know, man, books are made by the antagonist, right? I mean, right. that's, it's never the hero, you know, it's not Luke Skywalker that made Star Wars, it's Darth Vader and the hidden connections between, you know, so the, the dark characters, a lot, you know, I don't know how some writers miss this, but they do, but the villain <laughs> The villain is always the hero of his own story, you know. <laughs> yeah. He thinks it's his novel, and he's the hero. And you got to get that right. And then, of course, as far as the fallibility of, anti- of of protagonists, I mean, all you have to do is just look at real life. I mean, if you look, if you peel away enough layers of anybody's life, you come to what you know used to be called sin or fallibility or whatever, and you got to. You got to present that warts and all, and that's where humanity lies. I mean, any historical figure that's bigger than life, you know, it just inevitably you regret it, you hate to see it, but eventually the the, the hammer and the nails come out, and they get crucified because the the inner truth of their life comes out, and they're just as human as anybody else. And you got to be fair like that as a writer. And I never get madder than when some reviewer says I have stock characters or something I just go man you are full of it the one thing I don't <laughs> have is stock characters you know uh <laughs> yeah but you know I anyway I won't, won't even go yeah. there after s- such a big series so it's uh 2000 uh 2000 pages and you spent so much time uh with the story and these characters the new book cemetery road uh you get away from pen cage was that a uh a conscious effort to just wipe the slate clean and if so do you miss those characters in that story well i miss them and i I tell you i will i will be going back Uh, i've gotten thousands really of emails about that and people did not like that you know tom cage ended up in prison there and I, i think it served the story certainly it's what needed to happen but uh there's no way Tom's going to go out like that completely. That's all I'll say. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's one more trip back to the world of, of Natchez burning. And it was a relief to deal with Marshall in a new town. And, uh, also, you know, the primary difference, and I'll, I'll finish with this. The primary difference is Penn had a wonderful relationship with his father, just as I did with mine. I mean, Tom Cage in that trilogy was pretty much my dad in a lot of ways. Um, Cemetery Road is very, very different in that the protagonist had a terrible relationship with his father, even no relationship after 18, and to have to come back home because he's dying and navigate that rocky terrain is it was very – I've never written a story like that. And so it was uh, new for me, and but, it, but I think it's good, and hopefully people will find that's a welcome change too, you know. Um, so the, the new novel, uh, which is coming out, uh, tomorrow when people are hearing this, it's called Cemetery Road. Um, from, from the Natchez Burning trilogy, uh, where do we find, uh, where, where do you bring us to in this book? Well, this book, <laughs> this book is in a small Mississippi town. It's a fictional town, unlike, you know, I spent 10 years writing in the, town of my youth and a real place and a real place across the river in Louisiana, Concordia Parish. And man, you know, that's a tough thing to do. That's a minefield in a lot of ways. And, uh, so in this book, I gave myself the luxury of a fictional town, um, nearby my hometown in the fictional universe. And it's about a guy going through what a lot of people my age are, you know, he's off, he's gone, he left his town when he was young, wasn't a great circumstance and he meant never to come back. And, now that he's at the peak of his success in Washington, D.C., his father is ill, terminally ill, and he's forced to drop everything and go back home to deal with it. And I, I know so many people going through that, you know, people in their 50s, their late 40s, whatever, they, they're having to drop everything to deal with a parent who can't take care of themselves, and that's kind of repaying the debt of childhood. And when he comes back and has to run the family newspaper, that's what throws him into conflict with the the forces in the town that uh, represent, what would you say as a writer, you know, the shadow, the sort of Jungian shadow. And, um, 
you know, it's it's about something else I think is true all over America. A lot of these towns that were vibrant and thriving in the 60s are just shells of themselves. They've reached a tipping point. The people are desperate, whether it's here or it's the Rust Belt. Um, and it's how, how far will people go when economic salvation is offered, in this case, in the form of a Chinese paper mill. But it doesn't just have to be a small town. Look at Amazon going to New York, you know. People right. people get crazy when they think they can see millions of dollars, you know. And uh, But ultimately what it's about, like all my books, it's about the secrets that really drive human life, you know, the things people keep from each other, husbands and wives, parents and children, siblings and we we tend to judge the surface of life and and we're puzzled all the time you know why is this person being this way why is this happening in my town it's you just you lack the you're not seeing the true landscape you know the emotional and factual landscape is not the thing you see it's the things that people hide and i think that's the thing that runs through all my work well in the south uh and in mississippi particularly um specifically we have certain issues that that other parts of the country uh you know maybe don't don't deal with in in a public way the way we have in our past um do you ever get pushback from people for portraying the honest truth about uh about the way the world is sure i do especially especially when you start dealing with things like the Klan or the Confederacy or tradition, what are called traditions in Mississippi, et cetera, there's going to be pushback. I mean, we're living through some pretty profound changes culturally right now. And it's happening, I think, at a faster and faster pace, you know. And, and people, there are always people who are going to resist. And so people like me become a focal point for their, you know, their anger. That's just the way it is. But, you know, Natchez has been great about me setting novels there that are, you know, one, one reviewer said, Greg Isles does Natchez, Mississippi, the backhanded compliment of setting his novels there. (laughs) And I I think that's right. I mean, it looks pretty, pretty, pretty rough and not flattering, but yet, you know what, it's brought a lot of tourists there and, and people have been real, real good about it, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, Greg, I'm I'm a huge fan. Uh, the the new book Cemetery Road is out everywhere now. Uh, we're going to send everybody to to pick up a copy of it. Um, uh, if if people are just discovering you and your work, um, is there a place where they can read more about you online? Maybe dig into your back catalog and and all that good stuff. But just go to gregisles dot com, and uh, I don't know what better advice to give them. But look, the best thing they can do is just pick up a book and be be. Be aware that when you read me, any book that you pick up could be profoundly different from every other one. That's what <laughs> that's what's different about me from most writers, except maybe Michael Crichton, who, you know, he he did some pretty different stuff all over yeah. the map, you know. So yeah. I hope people will do that, and you know, they'll either like it or they won't. But I, I trust that they will. Well, and and just like a Michael Crichton book, you can always tell that it's a Crichton story, no matter where it is. And you can always tell that this is a Greg Isles book. Uh, it, it sounds like you. Um, so, yeah, we're going to put links to everything in the show notes. Greg, uh, it's been a huge uh, pleasure getting to talk to, with you. Uh, much success on the on the new book launch. Thanks, Hank, and good luck with your books, man. Look forward Thanks. to it. See you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. The brutes of the Andersonville Prison Hospital have moved me to the dead room, or so it has come to be known. None so domiciled have yet left this place. We receive only the smallest rations and only cursory care to reduce our odors and spare the nostrils of our keepers. The good Christians of the Confederacy do not see any need to provide comfort to those who will soon sleep soundly enough underground. You must know, at least, how your father came to such an end. At Doctortown, Kilpatrick entrusted me with the conquest of a railroad trestle, and my bummers, my demolition team, acquitted themselves admirably thanks to my ingenuity with powder. We successfully destroyed the trestle work past Morgan's Lake. This would prove to be my entire contribution to the war. Federal troops were unable to capture the bridge or overcome the enemy's battery. 
Kilpatrick withdrew, and my bummers and I found ourselves on the wrong side of the Altamaha River, behind the enemy line, with no hope of reaching our encampment. Rebels accosted us, taking our remaining supplies. We escaped and headed south, hoping by a long march to reach Seymour's forces in Jacksonville, but we encountered other rebel encampments at Jessup. Four of my men were lost to gunfire. We marched west, then south again, barely evading capture. We had no choice but to brave the great swamp Okefenokee. Oh, on and on it goes, in every direction, endlessly. We trudged through miles of grasping mud and noxious rot, pursued by hunger and the mosquito, scratching at our arms and faces until all our skin was scourged. We lived off alligator meat at first, then nothing at all. My men grew mutinous, blamed me for all their misfortunes, threatened to throw me in a sack, weigh me down with stones, and sink my body. Yet was I not equally hungry? Did I not starve? I grew weary of their endless insubordination and contempt. Finally, they took hold of me and swore they would hang me by the neck for leading them to ruin. They were five in number, younger than I and more muscular. I was no match for them physically. They lay their hands on me and I burned them. I burned those men. The flame rose from me as from a volcano, stripping the skin from those boys, blackening their faces, roasting their flesh. And let this be my final ghastly confession. I feasted that night, feasted on the meat of my prospective murderers. And that is how I survived. I staggered alone from that swamp, a mad thing, fueled by outrage and guilt. I saw an encampment of rebel soldiers and surrendered myself gladly. They say in Andersonville prison all men are brothers, equal in filth equal in terror, equal in ruin. Yet I feel I may claim some small distinction, at least, for I am surely damned to a greater extent than any here. <laughs>